Good morning. I'm Jeff, and that's spelled with a G like Chaucer. And uh, people look at me and go, what are you talking about? Now, if you, because English Lit, way back when, we had to read Chaucer. And the irony of that is nobody knows that today. Uh, but what Chaucer was writing about was Canterbury Tales and Pilgrim's Progress. So it seems ironic that the title that I end up with for this year is Fit for Service, and it's a pilgrimage. So let me, before I get into those verses, just talk about... Um, Oh, my hearing aid and my phone is ringing. If you would just <laughs> turn that off. My hearing aid picks up my phone. I'm going, I didn't bring my phone down with me. <laughs> so um, so uh, let me talk a little bit about a pilgrimage. When uh, the subject came up this year and Josh brought the title, I was thinking, well, you know, I don't know if I'm really on a pilgrimage. And I got to thinking about it, and, and really the pilgrimage that I've been on over the last few years is to understand a deeper, deeper understanding of what grace is, a deeper understanding of what faith is. And Josh talked about uh, over the last few weeks about the disciples and uh, their hard heartedness and their lack of faith because Jesus is teaching them and they're not getting it. Um, so I feel sort of like that that I'm in the process of what does what is the grace that we've been given really mean and it says that we're giving great given grace and it's uh, to overflowing and so how can we um, live by grace and give grace to those around us I think that's the hardest part of this pilgrimage is how do we give grace to those around us uh, and we tend to hold back and hold on to it because it's mine and so much in the world today, it's mine, and I don't want anybody else to come in and get some of that, when in fact we're being called to, to let that overflow just run off of us. So when it comes down to this fit for service, is it a statement or is it a question? And part of my pilgrimage has been to understand I've got more questions than I probably have answers for, and I've got to... I've got to seek those answers, and I've got to change when I find those answers. Um, so as a sidetrack of this pilgrimage I've been on, I, I started looking at the, what was coming up and fit for service, and I said, I need to go find out what Jesus was really telling his disciples. So by the benefit of my Bible being a red letter, I could go in and look at the red letters and read the specific words of Jesus through the Gospels. So I'm in that journey right now. But one of the things I'm finding is that uh, he was training all the time. And that those words aren't the words that I expect them to be. That we hear so many things from a world perspective that color what Jesus actually said. So I, it really raised a number of questions in the bottom of your outline. You'll see a number of questions that sort of thread through what I'm going to talk about today. Those are for you to, to look at uh, when you have a moment, um, not, uh, not something I'm going to call you to go through today. But in those personal times when doubts arise and opportunities present themselves, think about the questions that the Lord's asking you. Some of these may be similar to those questions, so I would encourage you in that. So in that journey, um, and what we're going to talk about today, we begin with the concept of uniqueness. When I first came to OCC, Josh said about the youth, he said, um, I would tell my youth that they're wonderfully and uniquely made. And some of you are here who have been through that with Josh. And I've seen in each of you um, that uniqueness, that abundant blessing that you poured out to us uh, that are older. And, you know, Alex and Everyone, we just rejoice that we have this time that we can share with you. 
you know, Barb went, said she had a pilgrimage to go on. And she started her pilgrimage and because she felt that calling. It's unique to her. And the, the fact that she's with us today is also unique to her. Because circumstances said, this journey is going to continue, but for the moment I have something different for you to do. And are we open to that change? Or are we fixed and unbending, hard-hearted and, and stiff-minded, if you will? So, you know, as you, as you prepare for discussions and messages like these, you start looking for inspiration. And we were blessed to be with our son in Tucson, and he works for Seven Cups Teas, who import, import teas from China, and he's an expert in teas, and he's just an amazing young man, even though I'm his father. Um, and so I got the newsletter from Seven Cups this week, not, not knowing that I was going to receive it this week, but... Um, so in the beginning of the newsletter, there's a little introduction to the T's and this time, uh, and we sort of can tell when Andrew writes it versus some of the other people. This time it was Andrew's signature on it. But let me read it to you because I think it speaks not in biblical terms, but to the things we need to consider today. Are we fit for service? So as, as he wrote, as with every year, the character of this year's teas will be slightly different from the year before. Their infusions of will manifest the variations of the weather, the circumstances of production, the running life cycle of the tea plants, and soil. Such variations are blended out of commodity tea. Let me say that again. Such variations are blended out of commodity tea. For our teas, we are excited to witness these changes and are happy to see each year's unique character retained for those who want to listen for it. So, why is this slide here? This is this year's monarch trip to Guatemala. And it takes a leap of faith to go to Guatemala. Now, since this is really about discipleship training, you see the disciples sitting here, or standing there. And they took on this stove this year with very little direction, but with a heart to serve, to serve this family. And to build this stove so that woman has a greater chance of survival to be able to breathe, to breathe life into her, into her family. Because otherwise, without that stovepipe, the smoke is in the room and she inhales it. And it's worse than smoking cigarettes and cigars and pipes and anything because it just fills your lungs with charcoal. But that's not necessarily the point. The point is that these young people went they took that leap of faith and they went and they took on the responsibility to do something outside their comfort zone. So you see Maddie Herbster in that picture. And Maddie has been extraordinary. We called her Machete Maddie two years ago and because she cut bricks with the machete and, and this year I think we called her Master Mason Maddie because she was great at laying bricks. And she helped, helped direct the other younger uh, people in the process. So I will have to tell you that um, as having tried to have control of that in the last years, this year was a blessing because these young people took on what I taught them and others had taught them and built the stove. And I stepped back, which was a huge blessing. So I will have to tell you, as being a member of OCC, Maddie Herbster is this year's Herbster blessing. Because, and I know that Dave spoke a few weeks ago, and there was another Herbster blessing. Herbsters have blessed us uh, personally at Monarch and, and certainly here at OCC. So I have to make that call out. But, you know, same thing with Barb. You know, it was a huge blessing to follow you and what you've been doing. Alex, it's a huge blessing to follow you and to know what you 
what you're, who you are and what you're doing and to each of you uh, to be an experience with you. That's what this community, what the church, the body of the church is supposed to be about. So, a pilgrimage, a journey, uh, I think the Dalai Lama said for, starts with the first step. Well, actually it doesn't. You can't take that first step without a leap of faith. These young, young people took a leap of faith. We're called to take a leap of faith because we really go back to the fit for service question. Are we fit for service? And my first answer, which I thought would be confrontational, was be none of you and I'm not fit for service too. We're just not. So let's, let's talk about the attitude that we that we bring to this idea of fit for service. And it brings us down to two men, Esau and Jacob. And so we look at the character who they are. Esau, I think, is a little bit, we'll spend more time on Esau than we will on Jacob. Uh, because as, as Josh talks about, there's a, you know, we talk about the lineage and ancestry and looking at the lineage and who's called out. Well, We'll hear a lot more about Jacob than we did last year when we were studying Joseph. We'll hear a lot more about Jacob. And you know those stories. We'll talk to him briefly in a second. But Esau, he sort of has a little gap. But the, his character ripples down through history. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So let's talk about Esau first. Esau was a skillful hunter and a, uh, a man of the world. A man of the field. So what is that sort of like Tom the tool man? Oh, oh yeah, okay, great, that's wonderful, you know. You meet those people and they're just sometimes just a joy to be around because they're, you know, they're adventurous, they'll do these things. But that's not necessarily what the fullness of this means. Uh, Esau was pretty bad character in that, yes, he loved the world and those things and as Josh talked about before, that's what distracted him. That his focus is on the flesh. His focus um, was on the things around him that weren't necessarily as important as those that might have been as important to Jacob and to Isaac and Rebekah. So, you know, we see that Jacob or um, Isaac loved Jacob because he like the venison. Rebecca loved, or excuse me, I went that backwards. Isaac loved Esau because of the venison. Rebecca loved Jacob, and it sort of stops there. The, and I'll put that to mother's intuition, is something about the heart, moms know. Something about what's going on and activities dads get involved in. That's why I think somewhere in scripture it says, uh, uh, dad, fathers do not frustrate your children. Because I have a tendency, and why would it be in there? Because we have a tendency to do that. But, set that aside. That Esau, named because he was hairy when he came out, if you remember that story that Josh talked about last week, was... He had hold, uh, Jacob had hold of Esau's heel. Uh, Esau came out first, so he's the firstborn son. But there was a struggle in Rebekah's womb, and they're, and they're holding on to each other coming out. Remember, these, these, are basic, these are twins. But there's this battle that's going on uh, the, between them, and a battle, if you will, an acronym for what do we face is in our lives, those battles in our lives. And in uh, 1 Samuel, it says, Lord, the Lord does not look at the, thi at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at our heart. That's where our attitude is. What's the attitude of our heart? What's the attitude of, your, of our heart is one of those questions, is where do we lean? What's the direction we go in? And where do we get distracted? What are the things that, that affect the lives around us? 
So this idea of where Esau had been in the field, I read some commentary and some um, historic Jewish commentary and he wasn't necessarily, the field has another meaning, it means he was out carousing around. And that one of his traits was sexually immoral. One of his conditions was that his focus was on the world. So does that seem to be consistent with what Jesus calls his disciples to do. And our parallel here is no. He says, come out of the world, come follow me. So in the verses you, you see, um, in today's verses, that he's calling them to, to depart, to get away from the distractions, to allow the dead, those that do not lean or want to follow, let them bury themselves. So we've got Esau back here and in some ways he's dead because he's just following the world. But we're, then we look at Esau from the perspective of, okay, he's come in from the field and he says, I'm famished, I'm going to die. And so, yeah, he's exhausted. He's, he's done lots of different things. And then he says, okay. Jacob goes, uh, Jacob goes to him and says, oh, well, hey, sell me your birthright. Now, they've been struggling about that since they've been in Rebecca's womb. And he was holding on to his heel and what's at the heel is Achilles tendon. Says, you know, what were the things that that we're going to struggle over, and one of them is faith. One of them is going to be what direction do our lives take. And so as he's holding on to his heel, he says, okay, now I've got this other opportunity to get that birthright back because he got out first and I got out second. So yeah, there's some manipulation there, right? But he comes down to that, what does Esau say? You know, I want the stew. Esau says... What good is my birthright to me? Give me the stew. And Edom came out of that because the stew was a red lentil stew and, and it was most likely because somebody had died and so he was taking that and consuming that and Edom came out of that. That became his second name, if you will. And out of Edom came a whole, as God had promised Rebecca, a whole nation. Well, Edom in Israel fought. And there was a continual battle going through, uh, through time. So Edom, um, as, a, as a nation, became a, a great nation. And just go to this idea of the battle over time, that when Moses came in from Egypt, to the promised land, what stood in his way and wouldn't let him through? Nation of Edom. And for all you movie fans, Petra, Raiders of the Lost Ark, city of Petra was one of those cities within Edom that was just south of the, of the Dead Sea and allowed it, the, that nation to block Moses as he came through. He had to find another way around. And I will say also that uh, but the lineage of Edom uh, also went to Eumidia and Herod Antipas at the time of Jesus was Eumidian. So you can see this thread over time of the battle for world flesh against what God's plans are. That's the challenge that we have in, our, in discipleship. So what good was the birthright to him? It wasn't any good to, to Esau. But why was Jacob so interested in having the birthright? Our first reaction is, well, he's going to be wealthy. He gets all this extra riches from his father, and he has control. 
to a certain extent, that's true. But I think there are three parts of that birthright we need to think about. First is the responsibility of that birthright as a leader of your family. You have a responsibility to look out for the whole family, the whole tribe, along all your travels. So is your heart right to do that? Where is your leaning to do that? The second, and, and tied greatly to that, maybe the most important, was that it's a spiritual leadership. It's the priesthood. It's part of that birthright. And the third part, which we look at the wealth, because you're handed an extra portion, and I sort of look at that extra portion is there's a lot of need within the family. And it comes back to this idea of grace. That extra portion of grace that we're given that we're supposed to be able to hand out. We don't need to hold on to it. It's an extra portion. We just need to be prepared when we're called and when we're asked to be able to give. Josh has said over the years, he said, and I think the things that stuck with me is, and the questions that I first asked myself, why am I hard-hearted? Why am I hard-headed? Why do I want control? Why do I want to manipulate this situation? Can I be a giver and not a taker? What's the attitude of my heart? So I look at this situation and, and what Jacob really saw was that here's an opportunity because I'm concerned that if Esau goes forward, what Rebecca saw in me will be lost. So what did she see in him? He was a man of the tents. So he wandered around in the tents and he got wisdom from the family. Jesus, as a young man, spent time in his father's house, in the temples. So, like Jesus, Jacob was learning. He was being prepared for this birthright that, yes, he got by manipulation. But it partly comes down to the choices that Esau made and the choices that Jacob made. The choices Esau made, Esau made was, I'll go to the world. I'll chase these other things because they're immediate, they're accessible, I have opportunity. Jacob had a longer view. What am I supposed to do? Where am I going? What's the pilgrimage I'm supposed to be on? And a continuation of the, of the pilgrimage that Abraham was called to do. And so we see these series of pilgrimages, and we share in that pilgrimage with them. So Jacob understood the birthright, and certainly Jesus understood the birthright. He knew what he was being called to do. And he told his disciples repeatedly, don't get in the way, follow me. Give of yourselves as servants. And they argued. They did like Jacob did. They struggled with, with what Jesus was asking them. And, you know, we focus on the 12, but he also sent out 72. And we don't see that lineage of the 72. They're just silent names. So welcome to the 72. All of us, if we're seeking the Lord, if we're following Jesus, are called to do the same things that he asked those 72 to do. To carry the word out. To heal. To cast out. And they had to have courage and faith to do that. And what did Jesus tell the 12? And he told the 72? You have little faith. How do we get greater and deeper faith? That's... I think the challenge and the question that I've been dealing with, how do, I get, how do I get to that point that I have enough courage to believe and trust that God can do all that he says that we should be capable of doing? Go back to our uniqueness. We are uniquely and wonderfully made, Josh said. God's word says, I, knew, I knit you together in your mother's womb. 
the psalmist says, I'm uniquely and wonderfully made. And so do we see our uniqueness and what are we called to do in our uniqueness? And as a body, do we celebrate our uniqueness or do we try to be blended like that tea? And when we're challenged by things of this world, what attitude do we bring to the table? So let's talk about that focus because most of the time we're distracted. So I, I went to the last of those verses in Luke 9, but Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. So what, what does that mean? Well, first of all, Jesus spoke in the things that his disciples knew, the economy of the times, vineyards, fishing, farming, baking. Those were things people knew and they could relate to. So the idea of relationship is we go out and serve. We need to do it in relationship. Not what we want or where we are, but where are those that we are meeting with or talking to? And more importantly, what are we saying? What is our actions and our words and our attitudes really telling? What are the seeds that we're planting? So, so the idea of putting the hand to the plow, well, Okay, one hand on the plow, and the plow basically is a, is a wooden V with a plowshare or a, a blade at the end tied to it and, and lines to the oxen out in front. But there was another part of that. Oxen's in front, plows behind, tethered to the oxen. There's also a wooden pole with uh, a spear at the end of it to prod the oxen forward. You've heard it later in scripture of prodding the goads when uh, Jesus was talking to, uh, to uh, Paul about, you know, why do you persecute me or prodding? So if you're handling a plow, and I've driven a plow with a, on a tractor with a hydraulic lift behind it, and I've worked with a rototiller in our garden, and our, and our neighbor, uh, when we first moved to Florida, Zeke, plowed with the type of plow we're talking about that Jesus talked about in Scripture. And in, and he was behind a mule and he'd plow at night because he worked all day and you can hear him singing up on the hill as he plowed. What's the point of the one hand on the plow, you have the other hand on the spear, you have a blade in front of you and oxen in front of you. And so there's a huge danger if you look back. And that huge danger is you might hit a rock. That blade pops out of the ground, it's going to come back at you or you're going to run into it because there's motion involved. Or you're going to trip on that spear and be speared. Simply, you may just trip over a rock or root and stumble. And the other thing, looking back, it's sort of like us looking back and saying, oh, look at the wonderful things that we've done. Esau, what are the wonderful things I've done? Or this is the venison I brought home today, as opposed to looking ahead and say, where am I supposed to be going? What are you asking me to do, Lord? Where, which direction do you want me to move? And I, I put it this way, it struck me that the when you're, you've got the oxen in front of you and you've got your hand on the plow and your other hand on the spear and you're walking through the furrows and the ground's being turned up right at your feet because it's happening right in front of you, you're working in the furrow, that who's doing the work? I think the oxen's doing the heaviest pulling. Certainly the farmer's doing some work. So the, when we look back, we look at our best, right? When we're looking forward and looking to God, he's doing the work. The resulting furrow is really his. Do we think about it that way? Do we think about doing our best is really seeking what he's doing? Seeking his best first, and then what flows out of that is ours? And we can share that with those around us? I think those are the things that we look at putting your hand to the plow and not looking back are important. And what did Jesus told everybody before in the prior verses? Come follow me. Simply put, if I'm an ox, come follow me. Because I'm going to do the pulling. I'm going to do the work. 
You just need to plant the seeds. And I'm going to give you the seeds. And if you're following and doing those things, then the seeds that fall out that I give you are going to produce because they're going in deeply rooted soils. If you remember the parable of the sower, you know, it, it uh, basically said, you know, seeds fall in rocky places, seeds fall on the, in uh, dry ground, seeds fall in deep soils. Are we the seeds that fall in deep soils? Are we willing to, to get our hand on the plow and follow Jesus? Because right here is deep soil. So let's go back to Jacob for a second because, you know, we're distracted. We don't always leave our hand on the plow and sometimes we just have to look back to see what happened. And Jacob, uh, one of the commentaries put it this way and I thought it was better than I could say. Jacob in many ways typifies the average believer. He was deceitful, manipulative, clever, bent on advancing his own causes for many years. After wrestling all night with the angel of the Lord at the brook, Jacob near Penel, his name was finally changed to Israel. Though he may have been somewhat slow to fully believe and trust God, Jacob's heart was inclined towards the things of the Lord. I, that's a confession. I struggle. I struggle with the Lord for a long time. Carl asked me, when did I come to the, know the Lord earlier? And that was just a prompt. Thank you, Lord. Um, I came to the age of 35. October 17th, 27th, 1985. Remember the moment. Some of people just knew the Lord. They just, my wife, you can see it in her. You can see the spirit moving in her. It took me a while to get there. I was struggling with the Lord. It took me a lot of years to get to a point where I said, Lord, you have to, have to take control and take, I got to take a leap of faith. And so that constant taking a leap of faith is what becomes important. And go back to our diversion to discipleship training. You know, that's what this is, uh, what this is about. There's the parable of the sower. And each represents somebody along the path. But in relationship to it, if you remember, Jesus, I can say that, Jesus had, had, had uh, admonished the Sadducees and was then admonishing the Pharisees. And he said in Matthew 22, and think of this in the context of this parable of the sower, he said, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads, and I'll call that as stones, and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So, heavy stones, plowing, lots of agricultural references, tea, unbending, Unwilling to not to be changed, caught up in traditions, caught up in the things that distract us from where we're being called as believers to go. To not take that leap of faith but do it under our own power, not rely on the oxen to pull the plow but try to push the plow ourselves. To try to sow seeds and create disciples when... There are seeds, and we're casting them out as if they had purpose, but they have no purpose because we haven't sought God first. We haven't honored him and said, what would you have me do? So Esau, I'm going to be distracted by the world. I'm going to do it my way and I'll sow certain seeds my ways. Well, he sowed lots of seeds and a nation came out of those seeds. Jacob, on the hand, sowed seeds and a nation came out of that seeds. It's his nation that endured. It was Esau's nation that was destroyed. The remnants, the ripples, rippled out. So what do we 
when we're talking to people and doing the things we do as Christians, and I'll lump us all together and say, I'm first guilty. Do we, what is the seed we sow? Why are we so afraid to turn people away at the door? Who knock on our door and say, I need, I need help. I want, those people want the same things that I want and are just like me. They just look different. They have different experiences. They're uniquely made. How come I react this way? How come I'm so hard-hearted? Lord, help me with my hard-heartedness. Matt went to Greece last year, or year before, I can't remember the year, last year, to reach out to the refugees. Okay, we've got a similar situation happening in our door. What are we doing? And these are children. It's a question I'm asking myself. What do I do? Do I stand behind whatever situation's occurring? What position do I take? When should I open my mouth? When should I have the courage to step up? When God calls me and says, I need you to go. I need you to follow me because he's going into that battle. He went before Moses. He went before, if we allow him to go before us. That's what we're, our challenge, allow him to go before us and understand that it's his harvest. We're just along the way, following him in that furrow, allowing the soil to receive the seeds. That we're the seed that grows up deeply rooted, growing tall like the mustard seed. But remember, with that plant, it's capable of dealing with the harshest weather, especially when it's strong and deeply rooted, and the conditions around us if we don't get distracted. Are we willing to change? To quote uh, another blessing, uh, are we ready to be surprised by the unexpected? Dave, thank you. Uh, most of the time, we're not. We want control of the unexpected. But God says, all good things happen for those who trust in the Lord. All good things happen for those who trust. Not just good things, but happen for those who trust. That out of the outcome, out of evil, good can come. Out of evil and Edom, good came. Jesus fulfilled the, the scriptures when Herod was the block, one of the blocks. What happened? Had he not done that, as Josh said, I guess last week, we focus on, on just what he did, but he's alive. We are disciples of the living God, the living Christ. And we are in, our lives are hidden in Christ. How wonderful is that? Do we take full advantage of that? So I'll relate to you um, that when we recognize that, that Esau had rejected because of the attitude of his heart and his unwillingness to change he was rejected, and the birthright had been given to Jacob. So when he came to Isaac, it said later in Genesis, for you know that even when Esau afterward desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for a change of mind, though he sought it diligently with tears. How do we get past our hard-heartedness and an attitude of the heart that we don't want to change. We had a choice, just like Jacob had a choice. And he wrestled with God. And it says he won. God won. So I'll give you two, two people. Uh, a waiter I met in Denver at a pizza place. And this is the idea of service is that he, when he, I went back to, to go to the restroom and 
I saw in his arm a psalm had been tattooed in his arm. He had lots of other tattoos, but I saw the psalm. And I asked him about it. He said, I put that on there to remind me where I've come from, but more importantly, where I'm going. He said, you know, I was in a bad place, and this church just accepted me. And that's the words that struck me, that they just accepted him. We look at Al, and he's got tattoos all over his body. Would, but this church accepted him. Do we still do that as a body? Just because they don't look exactly like us? Can we have a conversation with people when their views are different than our views? Today, it seems we, that people can't have a conversation at all because they want to be opposed and they want to fight before they can understand whether they have any commonalities. So let's talk about the Guatemala man. So the folks that uh, sponsor have the ministry in Guatemala and they own Infuse, Fusion Tea here in town and um, they were in Guatemala City and this man comes up and he's very agitated and he, I'll sum it up this way, he said to them, why do you, we let you into our country freely. Why do you not let it, us into your country freely. Now that could, we could take a political rabbit trail on that, but I think from a discipleship perspective, that Guatemala man was talking some truths. Why are we so afraid to allow Jesus to go before us and open the door? One of the verses that I that struck me in. October of 1975 was I stand at the door and knock and those who listen and invite me in I will come and dine with them if we if, we, if I kept that door closed I would be an Esau if I open the door I have a chance for life like the women in Guatemala they have an opportunity for a new breath each of us have that opportunity for a new breath today. Where does that journey start, that leap of faith? We're all at some place in that journey. The next step in that journey, yeah, oh, I can take the next step. But it takes a leap of faith to take the next step. I think Barb can testify that to every step she took along the trail. I think Alex can testify to every step that he takes. It's a blessing to us. Every time each of you take a leap of faith, it's a blessing to us. Do we have the courage to take that leap of faith? So, we get down to significance because one of the things that we saw in Esau and one of the things we saw in the disciples and what Jesus is constantly telling his disciples is uh, they're dealing with the, their identity and where their significance is. Who is the greatest among you? I want to be, I want to be the man of the field and the, the guy who brings home the venison um, wherever you are. And that's exactly what he man, uh, Jesus admonished the Pharisees over. You weight people down with all these traditions, but you accomplish nothing. Your significance isn't in that. Our significance isn't in that. But we constantly battle the flesh. Is, um, and it says in Ephesians, servants be obedient to those who, are, who according to the flesh are your masters with fear and trembling and singleness, singleness of your heart as to Christ, not in the way of service only, when eyes are on you as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that whatever good thing that each one does, he will receive the same again from the Lord, whether he is bound or free. So the first part is not in the way of service only when the eyes are on you. When we're feeling significant because we're the head of the table or we're making the presentation, it's not about me, 
It's me becoming less that he becomes more. So are, are the battles like Edom right, and uh, Esau and Jacob grabbing the heel over time, it comes down to where is our significance? Are we going to be caught up in the weeds? And where do I get cut up, caught up in the weeds and rocks? Are we seeking to please man or please God? Flesh or faith? Doubt or trust? Manipulating expectations or embracing the unexpected? Being served or serving? Think about going to a restaurant and when you've had great service. What was about that great service that made the difference? The, per the server was more concerned about your needs than their needs. Jesus was more concerned about training the disciples and what their needs were to change to be able to follow him. He said, the greatest among you will be the servant among you. That change of mind. We are wonderfully and uniquely made. How do we become less that he becomes more? How can I stay in step with the Holy Spirit and trust that God will do more, do more than I can think or imagine? So in looking through what Jesus was telling the disciples, he summed it up. Matthew, and you'd think I'd say, go and say, go make disciples of all nations. No, the quipping we need is Matthew 22 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All of it hangs on those two commandments. Easy. Follow, follow the Lord. Here's, here's the rules. Can we get beside ourselves to do that? Can we walk in that furrow behind the behind the plow and keep our eyes fixed ahead and allow him to reap the harvest that comes behind us because what he's done in us, do we share that? What are the words we tell? We are wonderfully and uniquely made for service. That's the answer to the first question, fit for service. We are capable of, to serve being deeply rooted in those soils, those good soils, capable of weathering change, changing to grow strong in the spirit, planting the seeds, if we choose to take that leap of faith and that leap of love by keeping our eyes fixed on the Lord. We may wrestle with God like Jacob but he will overcome our Esau. What is impossible for man is possible for God. Thanks.